Hi. You see what this has done to me? I have lost my freaking mind. Look at this. Look at this nonsense. What what caused me to do this? I I don't know. I just felt like felt like doing it. Never done it before. I no, that's not true. I did dye my hair black once, which doesn't make any sense because I'm already dark brown. So why would you go from dark brown to black? But whatever. We got uh, red now. Woohoo! All right, so you know the deal. Here we are, We're going into chapter seven now tonight. And I challenge you, even though there's currently nobody watching at the moment. These things always tend to jump up and then die again. That's all right. Uh, I think the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I'm not really expecting a different result tonight. So if you guys want to chime in and say stuff, go right ahead. Tell me dirty jokes. Do whatever you want. Try to throw me off. So we are going to start up chapter seven let's see uh what what was uh oh yeah out of the frying pan into the fire was chapter six they escaped from the wolves of the wargs uh from by the help of the eagles <clears throat> so here we go chapter seven the next morning bilbo woke up with the early sun in his eyes he jumped up and looked at the time to go and put his kettle on and found he was not at home at all so he sat down and wished in vain for a wash and a brush. He did not get either, nor tea, nor toast, nor bacon, ooh, now I'm hungry, for his breakfast. Only cold mutton and rabbit. Isn't that what the trolls were having? Mutton? <laughs> they were complaining about it. After all that, he was ready to get for a fresh start. This time he allowed, this time he was allowed to climb onto an eagle's back and climb between his wings. The air rushed over him as he shut his eyes. The dwarves were crying farewells and promising to repay the Lord of the Eagles if they ever could, as off rose fifteen great birds from the mountainside. The sun was still close to the eastern edge of things. The morning was cool, and mists were in the valleys, and hollows were twined here and there about the peaks and pinnacles of the hills. Bilbo opened an eye to peep and saw that the birds were already high up and the world was far away, and the mountains were falling back behind them into a distance. He shut his eyes again and held on tighter. Don't pinch, said the eagle. You need not be frightened like a rabbit, even if you'd rather look like one. You like the voice I gave the, the eagle? It is fair morning with little wind. What is finer than flying? Bilbo would have liked to say a warm bath and a late breakfast on the lawn afterwards, but he thought it better to just say nothing at all and let go of the clutch just a tiny bit. After a good while, the eagles must have seen the point where they were making for, even from the great height, for they began to go down, circling round in great spirals. They did this for a long time, and that the last hobbit opened his eyes again. The earth was much nearer, and below them were trees, and they looked like oaks and elms and wide grasslands and river running through it but cropping out of the ground right in the path of the stream that looked itself about it was a great rock, almost a hill of stone, like a last outpost of distant mountains or a huge piece cast miles into the plain by giant among giants. Quickly, now to the top of the rock, the eagles swooped one by one and set down with their passengers. Farewell, they cried, wherever you fare till your eeries receive you at your journey's end. That is the polite thing to say among eagles. May the wind under your wings bear you to where the sun sails and the mountain walks, answered Gandalf. Ooh, I didn't use his voice. <laughs> I look forward to using Gandalf's voice. Uh, who knew the correct reply for the eagles? And so they parted. And though the lord of the eagles came in after days the king of all birds and wore a golden crown and his 15 chieftains golden collars made of the gold that the dwarves gave them. Bilbo never saw them again except high and far off in the battle of five armies. That's prelude to something later. But as that comes in at the end of the tale 
we will say no more about it just now. Okay, now you're just teasing yourself at this point. God. I realize I look like Steve Carino post-match in old ECW where he got all bloodied. <laughs> Ugh. Then there was a flat space on the top of the hill of stone, and there was a well-worn path with many steps leading down to the river, across which a ford of huge flat stones led to the grassland beyond the stream. There was a little cave, a wholesome one with a pebbly floor, at the foot of the steps and near the end of the stony ford. Here the party gathered and discussed what was to be done, as I can hear my kids screaming out there. I always meant to see you. All safe, if possible. Oh, boy, these pages are thick. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Start again. I always meant to see you all safe, if possible, over the mountains, said the wizard. And now, by good management and good luck, I have done it. Indeed, we are now a good deal farther east than I ever meant to come with you. For, after all, this is not my adventure. I may look in on it again before it is all over, but in the meanwhile, I have some other pressing business to attend to. The dwarves groaned and looked distressed, and Bilbo cried. They had begun to think Gandalf was going to come all the way and would be able to help them in difficulties. I am not going to disappear at this very instant, said he. I can give you a day or two more. Probably I can help you out, your present plight, and I need a little help myself. We have no food, and no baggage, and no ponies to ride, and you do not know where you are. Now I will tell you that. You still know some miles north of the path which we should have been following. If we had not left the mountain pass in a hurry, very few people live in these parts unless they have come here since I was last down this way, which is some years ago. But there is somebody that I know of who lives not far away. That somebody made the steps on the Great Rock. The Karak, I believe he calls it. He does not come here often, certainly. Not in the daytime, and it is no good waiting for him. In fact, it would be very dangerous. We must go and find him. And if all goes well at our meeting, I think we shall be off and wish you, like the eagles, farewell wherever you fare. They begged him not to leave. They offered him dragon gold and silver and jewels, but he would not change his mind. We shall see, we shall see, he said. And I think I have earned already some of your dragon gold when you have got it. After that, they stopped pleading. Then they took off their clothes and bathed in the river, which was shallow and clear in the stony ford. Then they had dried in the sun, which was now strong and warm, and they refreshed as if sore and little hungry. Soon they crossed the ford, carrying the hobbit, and then began to march through the long green grass and down the lines of the wide arms oak and tall elms. And why is it called the Karak? said asked Bilbo as he went along the river the wizard's side. It's called the Karak because the Karak is a word for it. Thanks. Thanks, Gandalf. He calls things like Karaks, and this one is the Karak, because it's the only one near his home, and he knows it well. Who calls it? Who knows of it? The somebody I spoke of a very great person. You must all be very polite when I introduce you. I shall introduce you slowly, two by two, I think. And you must be careful not to annoy him, or heaven knows what will happen. He can be appalling when he is angry, though he is kind enough if humored. Still, I warn you, if he gets angry easily... The dwarves all gathered round when they heard the wizard talking like this to Bilbo. Is that the person you are taking us to now? They asked. Couldn't you find someone more easily tempered? Haven't you better explain it all a bit clearer? And so on. Yes, it certainly is. No, I could not. And I was explaining very carefully, answered the wizard crossly. 
If you must know more, his name is Bjorn. He is very strong, and he is a skin changer. What? A furrier? A man that calls rabbits connies? When he doesn't turn their skins into squirrels? asked Bilbo. Good gracious heavens, no, 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 said Gandalf. Don't be a fool, Mr. Baggins, if you can help it. The sass on this guy. And then... Did I skip a page? Okay. And in the name of all wonder, don't mention the word furrier again, as long as you are within a hundred miles of his house. No rug, cape, tippet, muff, nor any such unfortunate word. He is a skin changer. He changes his skin. Sometimes he is a huge black bear. Sometimes he is a great, strong, black-haired man with huge arms and a great beard. I cannot tell you much more, though it ought to be enough. Some say that he is a bear, descended from the great and ancient bears of the mountains that lived there long before the giants came. Others say that he is a man descended from the first man who lived before Smog, or other dragons came into this part of the world. And before the goblins came into the hills out of the north, I cannot say, though I fancy, the last is the true tale. He is not the sort of person to ask questions. Uh, at any rate, he is under no enchantment but his own. He lives in an oak wood and has a great wooden house. And he is a man he keeps cattle and horses which he is neatly as marvelous as himself. They work for him and talk to him. He does not eat them, nor does he hunt or eat wild animals. He keeps hives and hives of great fierce bees and lives most on cream and honey. As a bear, he ranges far and wide. I once saw him sitting all alone on top of a karak at night, watching the moon sinking towards the bears. The day will come when they will perish and I shall go back. That is why I believe he once came from the mountains himself. Gandalf is a taxing voice, but I do it out of love. Bilbo and the dwarves now had plenty to think about, and they asked no more questions. They still had a long way to walk before them. Up slope and down dale they plodded. It grew very hot. Sometimes they rested under the trees, and then Bilbo felt so hungry that he would have eaten acorns if they had not been any ripe enough yet to have fallen to the ground. It was the middle of the afternoon before they noticed that a great patches of flower had begun to spring up, and the same kind growing taller all together as if they had been planted. Especially there was clover, waving patches of cat coxcomb clover, and purple clover, and wide stretches of short, wide, sweet, honey-smelling clover. That's a lot of clover. There was a buzzing and a whirling and a doming in the air. Bees were everywhere, and such bees. Bilbo had never seen anything like them. If one of them was to stig me, he thought, I should swell up as big as I am. They were bigger than hornets. The drones were bigger than your thumb. A good deal of the bands of yellow on the dip black bodies of their shone like fairy gold. We are getting near, said Gandalf. We are on the edge of his bee pastures. After a while they came to a belt of tall and ancient oak, and beyond these to a high thorn hedge through which you can never see nor scramble. You had better wait here, said the wizard to the dwarves, and when I call or whistle begin to come after me, you will see the way I go but only in pairs, mind, about five minutes between each of you. Bomber is the fattest and will do for two. He has better come along and last. Come, Mr. Baggins, the gate's somewhere around this way. And with that, they, oh, <laughs> and with that, they went off along the hedge and went th taking the frightened hobbit <laughs> along with him. They soon came to a wooden gate high and broad, beyond which they could see the gardens and a cluster of low wooden buildings, some thatched and some unshaped logs, barns, stables, sheds, and a long wooden house. 
Inside of the southward side of the great hedge were rows and rows of hives of well-shaped tops made of straw. The noise of the giant bees flying to and fro crawling in and out filled the air. The wizard and the hobbit pushed open the heavy creaking great gate and went down the wide track towards the house. Some horses, very sleek and very well groomed, trotted up across the grass and looked at them intently with very intelligent faces. Then off they galloped to the buildings. They have gone to tell him the arrival of strangers. Oh, let's do this properly. They have gone to tell him the arrival of strangers, said Gandalf. Soon they reached the courtyard, three walls of which were formed by a wooden house and its two long wings. In the middle, there was lying a great oak trunk with many lop branches beside it. Standing near was a huge man with a thick black beard and hair and great bare arms and legs and knotted muscles. He was clothed in a tunic of wool down to his knees and was leaning on a large axe. The horses were standing by him with their noses at his shoulder. Oh, here they are, he said to the horses. They don't look dangerous. You can be off. He laughed a great rolling laugh, put down his axe, and came forward. Who are you and what do you want? He asked gruffly, standing in front of them and towering tall above Gandalf. As for Bilbo, he could easily have trotted through his legs without ducking his head and missed the fringe of the man's brown tunic. I am Gandalf, said the wizard. Never heard of him, growled the man. And what's this little fellow? He said, stooping down to frown at the hobbit with his bushy black eyebrows. This is Mr. Baggins, a hobbit of good family and unpeccable reputation, said Gandalf. Bilbo bowed, but had no hat to take off and was painfully conscious of his many missing buttons. I am a wizard, continued Gandalf. I have heard of you and have you heard, not heard of me, but perhaps you have heard of my good cousin, Radagast, who lives near the southern borders of Mirkwood. Yes, not a bad fellow as wizards go, I believe. I used to see him now and again, said Bjorn. Well, now I know who you are, or who you say you are. What do you want? To tell you the truth, we have lost our luggage and nearly lost our way, and are rather in need of help, or at least advice. I may say we have a rather a bad time with goblins in the mountains. Goblins? said the big man less gruffly. Oh, ho. So you have been having trouble with them, have you? What did you go near them for? We did not mean to. They surprised us at night in a pass which we came to cross. We were coming out of the lands over the west into these countries. It is a long tale. Then you had better come inside and tell me some of it. It won't take all day. And the man leading the way through the dark door that opened in the courtyard of the house. Following him, they found themselves in a wide hall, with a fireplace in the middle. Though it was summer, there was wood burning, and the smoke was rising to the blackened rafters in search of the way to the, to the open roof. They passed through the dim hall, lit only by a fire and a hole above it, and came through another smaller door into a sort of veranda propped on the wooden post made of single tree trunks. It faced southward and was still warm and filled with the light of the western sun which slanted into it and fell onto the golden garden full of flowers that came right up to the steps. Here they sat on wooden benches while Gandalf told his tale and Bilbo swung his dangling legs and looked at the flowers in the garden, wondering what their names could be, and he had never seen half of them before. I was coming over the mountains with a friend or two, said the wizard. Or two? I only see one, and that little one is that, said Bjorn. Well, to tell you the truth, I did not like to bother you with a lot of us, until I found out if you were busy. I will call them, if I may. Go on, call away. So, <clears throat> I better... Yes, sir. <coughs> yeah, I come. Here we go. 
So Gandalf gave a long, shrill whistle, and presently Thorin and Dory came around the house by the garden path and stood bowing before them. One or three, you mean, I see, said Borin, but these aren't hobbits, these are dwarves. Thorin Oakenshield, at your service. Dory, at your service, said the dwarves, bowing again. I don't need your service, thank you, said Bjorn, but I expect you need mine. I am not over fond of dwarves, but it is true that you are Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thor, I believe and your companion is respectable, and that you are enemies of goblins and are not up to any mischief in my lands. What are you up to, by the way? They are on their way to visit the land of their fathers, east away beyond Mirkwood, put in Gandalf, and it is entirely by accident that we are on your lands at all. We were crossing by the high pass that should have brought us to the road that lies to the south of your country, when we were attacked by those evil goblins. I was about to tell you. Go on, telling then, said Bjorn, who was never very polite. There was this terrible storm. The stone giants were out hurtling rocks as the size of the head. At the head of the pass, we took refuge in the cave, the hobbit and I and several of our companions, do you call two several? Well, no. As a matter of fact, we there were more than two. Where are they? Killed? Eaten? Gone home? Well, no. They don't seem to, to have come when I whistled. Shy, I expect. You see, we are very much afraid that we are rather a lot for you to entertain. Go on, whistle again. I'm in for a party, it seems, and one or two or more won't make much difference growled Bjorn. Gandalf whistled again, but Nori and Ori were there almost before he had stopped. If you remember, Gandalf had told them to come in pairs every five minutes. Hello, said Bjorn. You came pretty quick. Were you hiding? Come on my jack-in-the-boxes. Nori, at your service. Ori, at, they began, but Bjorn interrupted. Thank you. When I want your help, I will ask for it. Sit down, and let's get on with this tale, or it'll be supper time before it is ended. As soon as we were asleep, went on Gandalf, a crack in the back of the cave opened. Goblins came out and grabbed the hobbit and the dwarves and a troop of our ponies. Troop of ponies? What were you? A traveling circus? Or were you carrying lots of goods? Or do you always call six? A troop. Oh no, as a matter of fact, there were more than six ponies, for there were just more than six of us, and well, here are two more. Just at that moment, Balin and Dwalin appeared and bowed so low that the beard swept the stone floor. The big man was frowning at first, but they did their very best to be frightfully polite and kept on nodding and bending and bowing and waving their hoods before their knees in proper dwarf fashion until he stopped frowning and burst into a chuckling laugh. They looked so comical. Troop was right, he said. A fine comic one. Come in, my merry men. And what are your names? I don't want your service now. Only your names and sit down and stop wagging. Balin and Dwalin, they said, not daring to be offensive, and sat on the floor, looking rather very surprised. Now go on again. Bjorn said to the wizard. Where was I? Oh yes, I was not grabbed. I killed a goblin or two in a flash. Good, cried Bowen. Bjorn. Yeah, who's Bowen? <laughs> it is good being a wizard then. And slipped inside the crack before it closed. I followed down into the main hall, which was cowered with goblins. The great goblin was there with thirty or forty armed guards. I thought to myself, even if they were not all chained together, what can a dozen do against so many? A dozen? That's the first time I've heard eight called a dozen. Or have you still got some more jacks you don't have yet come out of their boxes? Well, yes, there seems to be a couple here now. Feely and Keely, I believe. As said Gandalf, as these two now appear, stood smiling and bowing. That's enough, said Bjorn. 
Sit down and be quiet. Now go on, Gandalf. So Gandalf went on to the tale until he came to the fight in the dark, the discovery of the lower gate, and their horror when they found Mr. Bang and said had been mislaid. We counted ourselves and found that there was no hobbit. There was only 14 of us left. 14. That's the first time I've heard from 10 leave 14. You mean 9? Or else you haven't told me yet all the names of your party. Well, of course I haven't seen Oin and Gloin yet. And bless me, here they are. I hope you will forgive them for bothering you. Oh, let them all come. Hurry up. Come along, you two. Sit down. But look here, Gandalf. Even now we have only got yourself and ten dwarves and the hobbit. That was lost. That only makes eleven, plus one mislaid. And not fourteen, unless wizards count differently to other people. But now, please get on with the tale. Bjorn did not show it more than he could help, but he was really had begun to get very interested. You see, in the old days, he had known the very part of the mountain that Gandalf was describing. He nodded and growled when he heard of the hobbit's reappearance and, the, and their scramble down the stone slide with the wolf ring in the woods. When Gandalf came to their climbing into the trees with the wolves all underneath, he got up and strode about and muttered, I wish I had been there. Oh, that's Bjorn. I wish I had been there. I would have given them more than just fireworks. Well, said Gandalf, very glad to see that his tale was making a good impression. I did the best I could. There were, with the wolves going mad under us, and forests beginning to ablaze in places where the goblins came down from the hills and discovered us. They yelled with delight and sang songs, making fun of us. Fifteen birds and five fir trees. Good heavens, growled Bjorn. Don't pretend that goblins can't count. They can. Twelve isn't fifteen, and they know it. And so do it. There were Biffer and Buffer as well. And I haven't ventured to introduce them before, but here they are now. In game. This sounds like a game show. And here come. The, coming on down, Biffer and Buffer. It's your turn on the price is right. In came Biffer and Buffer. And me, Grass Bomber, puffing up behind. He was fat and also angry at being left until last. He refused to wait the five minutes and followed immediately after the other two. Well, now there are fifteen of you. And since goblins can count, I suppose it is that they are up the trees. Now perhaps we can finish the story without any more interruptions. Mr. Baggins saw then how clever Gandalf had been. The interruptions had really made Bjorn more interested in the story, and the story had kept him from sending the dwarves off at once like suspicious beggars. He never invited people into his house, if he could help it. He had very few friends and lived a good way away. He was never invited to more than a couple of these into his house at a time. Now he's got 15 strangers sitting in his porch. By the time the wizard had finished his tale and had told the eagle's rescue and how they had all been back to the Karak, the sun had fallen behind the peaks of the Misty Mountain, and the shadows were long in Bjorn's garden. It's a very good tale, he said. The best I have heard for a long time. If all beggars could tell such a good one, they might find me kinder. You might be making it all up, of course, but you deserve a supper for the story of all the same. Let's have something to eat. Yes, please, they all said together. Thank you very much. Inside the hall, it was now quite dark. Bjorn clapped his hands and in trotted four beautiful white ponies and several large, long-bodied gray dogs. Bjorn said something to them in a strange language that animal noises turned to talk. They went out again and soon came back, carrying torches in their, in their mouths, which they were lit at the fire and struck in low brackets on the pillars in the hall along the central hearth. The dogs could stand on their hind legs when they wished and carry things with their fore feet. Quickly, they got out boards and trestles from the side walls and set them up near the fire. They went, blah, 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 was heard, and then in came snow-white sheep by a large coal-black ram. One bore a white cloth embroidered at the edges with figures of animals. 
Others bore on their broad backs trays with bowls and platters and knives and wooden spoons, which the dogs took quickly and laid out the tray, the tables. He's got animals as servants. These were very low, low enough for even Bilbo to sit at comfortably. Besides them was a pony pushed two low seated benches with wide rush bottoms and little short thick legs for Gandalf and Thorn. While at the far end he put Bjorn's big black chair of the same sort in which he sat in with great legs that stuck out far under the table. These were all the chairs that he had in his hall and probably had them low like the tables for the convenience of the wonderful animals that waited on him. What did the rest sit on? They were not forgotten. The other ponies came in rolling round drum-shaped sections of logs, smoothed out, polished, and low enough for even Bilbo. So soon they were all seated at Bjorn's table, and the hall had not seen a gathering for many a year. There they had supper and dinner, and they had such not had, and they had not had such. They had left the last homely house in the west and said goodbye to Elrond. The light of the torches were flickered about them, and on the table were two red beeswax candles. All the time they ate, Bjorn in his deep rolling voice told tales of the wild lands in his side of the mountains, and especially of the dark and dangerous wood that lay outstretched far to the north and south a day's ride before bearing their way to the east, a terrible forest of Mirkwood. The dwarves listened and shook their beards, for they knew what they must venture into that forest, and after the mountains it was the worst of the perils had passed before they came to the dragon's stronghold. When dinner was over they began to tell tales of their own, but Bjorn seemed to be growing drowsy and paid little heed to them. They spoke most of the gold and silver and jewels and making of things by smithcraft, and Bjorn did not appear to care for such things. There were no things of gold or silver in his hall, and few save the knives were made of metal at all. They sat long at the table with their wooden drinking bowls filled with mead. The dark night came out on side. The fires in the middle of the hall were built with fresh logs, and the torches were put out, and they still sat in the light of the dancing flames with the pillars of the house standing tall behind them. The dark at the top of the trees of the forest. Whether it was magic or not, it seemed to Bilbo that he had heard a sound like wind in the branches stirring in the rafters and the hoot of owls. Soon he began to nod with sleep, and the voices seemed to grow far away until they had, he had woke with a start. The great door had creaked and slammed. Bjorn was gone, the dwarves sitting cross-legged on the floor round the fire. And presently they began to sing. Oh God. Some of the verses were like this, and some were many more, and their singing went on for a long while. How long of a while are we talking? Holy cow. Okay. <sighs> I don't know this song. I don't know its tempo. I don't know its pitch. I don't know anything. So I'm going to read it kind of like poetry. The wind was on the withered heath. But in the forest stirred no leaf. Their shadows lay by night and day, and dark things crept beneath. That's a sloppy rhyme. The wind came down from mountains cold, and like it tide roared and rolled. The branches groaned, and forests moaned, and leaves were laid upon the mold. Eh, okay. The wind went down from east to west. And movement in the forest ceased, but shrill and harsh across the marsh, its whistling voices were released. The grasses hissed, their tassels bent, the reeds were rattling, on it went. O'er shaken pool under heaven's cold, where racing cold clouds were torn and rent. Wow, that's really sloppy. <laughs> that's, hey, I didn't write it. It passed by the mountain bear and swept above the dragon's lair. There back and dark lay boulder stark, and flying smoke was in the air. It would live the world and took its flight over the wide seas of the night. The moon set sail upon the gale, and stars were fanned to leaping light. 
Bilbo began to nod again. Suddenly, up stood Gandalf. It is time for us to sleep, he said. For us, but not, I think, of Bjorn. In this hall, we can rest sound and safe. But I warn you not to forget that Bjorn said before he left, you must not stray outside until the sun is up on your own peril. Bilbo found the beds had already been laid to the side of the hall on a sort of raised platform between the pillars and the outer wall. All right. <laughs> We're rhyming already. For him, there was little mattress of straw and woolen blankets. He snuggled into them very gladly. Summertime, he thought it was. The fire burned low, and he fell asleep. Yet in the night he woke, the fire had now sunk to a few embers. The dwarves and Gandalf were all asleep. Your judge by their breathing, a splash of white on the floor came from the high moon, which was peering down through the smoke hole in the roof. There was a growing sound outside, the noise of some great animal scuffling at the door. Bilbo wondered what it was and whether it could be Bjorn in enchanted shape, and if he would come in as a bear and kill them. He divided under the blankets and hid his head and fell asleep again, at last in spite of his fears. It was full morning when he awoke. One of the dwarves had fallen over him in the shadows where he lay and had rolled down with a bump from the platform to the floor. It was Bofur, and he was grumbling about it. When Bilbo opened his eyes, Get up, lazy bones, he said, or there will be no breakfast left for you. Up jumped Bilbo. Breakfast, he cried. Where's breakfast? Mostly inside us, answered the other dwarves who were moving about the hall. But what is left is out on the veranda. We have been looking for Bjorn ever since the sun got up, and there's no sign of him anywhere. Thought we found breakfast laid out as soon as we went out. Where's Gandalf? asked Bilbo, moving his head to find something to eat as fast as he could. Oh, out and about somewhere, they told him. But we saw no sign of the wizard all that day until the evening. Just before sunset, he walked into the hall where the hobbit and the dwarves were having supper, waited on by Bjorn's wonderful animals, as they had been all day. Bjorn, they had seen, heard nothing since the night before, and they were getting puzzled. Where is our host, and where have you been all day yourself, they cried. One question at a time, and none till after supper. I haven't had a bite since breakfast. At last, Gandalf pushed away his plate and jug. He had eaten two whole loaves with masses of butter and honey and clotted cream. What is clotted cream? I don't know. Maybe it's cream that's gone bad. Ugh. And drunk at least a quart of mead. And he took out his pipe. I will answer all the questions first, he said. But bless me, this is a splendid place for smoke rings. Indeed, for a long time, they could get nothing more out of him. He was so busy sending smoke rings dodging around the pillars of the hall, changing them into all sorts of different shapes and colors, and setting them at last chasing one another out the hole in the roof. They must have looked very strange from outside, popping out into the air after one another. Green, blue, red, silk, red, red, silver gray, yellow, white, big ones, little ones, little ones. It says little ones twice. Okay, big ones, little ones, little ones dodging through big ones and joining the figure eights to going off like a flock of birds in the distance. Yee! I've been picking out Bear tracks, he said at last. There must have been a regular bears meeting outside here last night. I soon saw that Bjorn could not have made them at all. There were far too many of them, and there were various sizes, too. I should say there were little bears, large bears, ordinary bears, and gigantic big bears, all dancing outside from dark to nearly dawn. They came from almost every direction, except from the west, over the river from the mountain. In that direction, only one set of footprints led, none coming, only going away from here. I followed these as far as the Karak. There they disappeared into the river, by the water was too deep and was strong beyond the rock for me to cross. It is easy enough, as you remember, to get back from this place from to the Karak by the ford, but in the other side the cliff spanning up from a swirling channel. 
I have to walk miles before I found a place where the river was wide and shallow enough for me to wade and swim, and then miles back again to pick up the tracks again. By this time, it was too late for me to follow them far. They went straight off into a mountain of the pine woods in the east of the Misty Mountain, where we had a little pleasant little party with the wargs the night before. And now I think I have answered your first question too, ended Gandalf, and he sat with a long while silent. Bilbo thought he knew what the wizard meant. What shall we do, he cried. If he leads us all if he leads all the wargs and the goblins down here, we'll all be caught and killed. I thought you said he he was not a friend. I thought you said he was not a friend of theirs. <laughs> so I did. And don't be silly. You had better go to bed. Your wits are sleepy. Didn't they just have breakfast? Dang, time goes quick in some days. The Hobbit felt quite crushed, and there was seemed little else that he could do to go to bed. The while the dwarves were still singing songs, he drooped to sleep, still puzzling his little head about Bjorn, until he dreamed a dream of a hundred black bears dancing slowly heavy dances round and round in moonlight in the courtyard. Then he woke up with everybody else asleep, and he heard the same scraping, scruffing, snuffling, and growling as before. The next morning they were all awakened by Bjorn himself. So here you are, still here, he said. He picked up the hobbit and laughed. Not eaten by the wargs or goblins or wicked bears yet, I see. He poked Mr. Baggins' waistcoat most disrespectfully. Little Bunny is getting nice and fat again on bread and honey, he chuckled. Come, have some more. So they all went to breakfast with him. Bjorn was in a jolly for a change. Instead, he seemed to be in a splendidly good humor and set them all laughing with his funny stories. Nor did they have to wonder long before where he had been or why he was so nice to them, for he told them himself. He had been over the river, right back up into the mountain, from which you can guess where he could travel quickly, in bear shape at any rate. From the burnt wolf glaze, he had soon found out that part of their story was true, but he had found more than that. He had caught a warg and a goblin wandering in the woods. From these, he had gotten news that goblin patrols were still hunting with wargs for the dwarves, and they were fiercely angry over the death of the great goblin. And after being of the burning of the chief wolf's nose and the death of the wizard's fire of so many of his chief servants, so much they told him where he forced them, but he guessed there was more wicked than this afoot, and that a great raid of whole goblin army and their wolf allies into the land shadowed by mountains might soon made find the dwarves, or take vengeance on the men and the creatures that lived there, and who they thought they must be sheltering them. Thank you everybody for, for staying in for so long. How long have we been going now? 40, 40 minutes. <clears throat> we gotta be wrapping up this chapter soon. It was a good story, that of yours, said Bjorn, but I still like it better now that I am sure it is true. You must forgive my not taking your word. If you live near the edge of Mirkwood, you would take the word of no one that you did not know as well as your own brother or better. As it is, I can only say that I have hurried home fast as I could to see that you are safe, and to offer you any help that I can. I shall think more kindly of dwarves after this. Killed the great goblin. Killed the great goblin. He chuckled fiercely to himself. What did you do with the goblin and the warg? He, Bilbo asked suddenly. Come and see, said Bjorn, and they followed round the house. A goblin's head was stuck outside the gate, and Warg's skin was nailed to a tree just beyond. Bjorn was a fierce enemy. By now he was their friend, and Gandalf thought it wise to tell them their whole story and the reason for their journey, so they could get the most help he could offer. This is what he promised to do for them. He would provide ponies for each of them, and a horse for Gandalf for their journey through the forest as he could lay with them food to last for weeks with care and packed it so it to be easy as possible to carry. Nuts, 
flour, sealed jars of dried fruit, red Ethanware pots of honey, twice baked cakes, twice baked. Is that okay? Twice baked. That would keep a good long time. Oh, okay, it's dry as hell. <laughs> That's why it's twice baked. The making of these were one of the secrets, but honey was in them, as most of his foods, as they were good to eat, though they made one thirsty. Water, he said, would not be needed to carry at the side of the force, for they were streams and springs along the road. But your way difficult Markwood is dark, dangerous, and difficult, he said. Water is not easy to find there, nor food. The time is not yet come for nuts, though it might be past and gone, indeed, for you to get to the other side. And nuts are about all that grows there fit for food. If there is wild, things are dark, strange, and savage. I will provide with you skin for carrying water, and I will give you some bows and arrows. But I doubt very much whether anything you find in Workwood would be wholesome to eat or drink. There is one stream there, I know, black and strong, which crosses the path. That you should neither drink of nor bathe in, for I have heard it carries enchantment and great drowsiness and forgetfulness. And in the dim shadows of that place, I do not think... Do not think... And in the dim shadows of that place, I don't think you will shoot anything, wholesome or unwholesome, without straying from the past. That you must not do for any reason. That is the advice I can give you. Beyond the edge of the forest, I cannot help you much. You must depend on your luck and your courage and the food I send with you. And the gate of the forest, I must ask you to send back my horses and the ponies. But I, m I wish you all speed, and my house is open to you if you ever come back this way again. They thanked him, of course, with many bows and sweeping of their hoods, and with many at your service, O master of the wide wooden well halls. Wide wooden halls, that's it. But their spirits sank in his grave words, and they all felt that the adventure was far more dangerous than they had thought, while at a time that if they had passed the perils of the road, the dragon was waiting at the end. All that morning they were busy with preparations. Soon after midday they ate with Bjorn for the last time, and after the meal, they mounted the steeds he was leading them, and biting them to many farewells, they rode off through the gate of a good place. At soon they left the high hedges of the east of his fenced lands, and turned north, and then bore to the northwest. By his advice, they were no longer making for the main forest road to the south of his land. Had they followed the pass... Their path would have led them down a stream from the mountain that joined the great river miles south of the Karak. At that point, there were deep fords in which they might have passed if they had still had their ponies, and beyond the track led to the skirts of the wood and the entrance of the old forest road. Not old country road, but Bjorn had warned them that way was now often used by the goblins, while the forest road itself, he had heard, was overgrown and disused at the east end and led to impassable marshes, which were paths had long pen passed. <laughs> its eastern opening had also been laid far to the south of the Lonely Mountain and would have left them with a long and difficult northward march when they got to the other side. North of the Karak at the edge of Markwood drew closer to the borders of the Great River, and through here the mountains drew town nearer. Bjorn advised them to take this way, for at a place of a few days' ride due north of the Karak was the gate of the little-known pathway through Markwood that would lead almost straight towards the Lonely Mountain. <clears throat> The goblins, Bjorn had said, will not dare to cross the great river for a hundred miles north of Karak, nor come near my house. It is well protected at night, but I should ride fast, for if it might make their raid soon, they will have crossed the river to the south and scour all the edges of the forest so as to cut you off, and wargs run swifter than ponies. 
Still, you are safer going north, even through, even though you seem to be going back nearer to their stronghold, for that is where they least expect you, and they will have no longer ride to catch you. By all, be off now, as quick as you may. That is why they were now riding in silence, galloping whenever the ground was grassy and smooth with the mountains dark on their left, in the silence of the line of the river, with its trees growing ever closer. The sun had just turned west when they started, until laying in the lay of the golden of the land about them. It was difficult to think of pursuing goblins behind, and when they had put many miles behind them, and Bjorn's house, they began to talk and sing again and forget the dark forest path that lay in front. But in the evening, when the dusk came on the mountains and the peaks glowered against the sunset, they made a camp and set a guard. And most of them slept uneasily with dreams of which there came a howl of hunting wolves and the cries of goblins. Still the next morning dawned bright and fair again. The days go pretty quick here. Uh, say that uh, there was an autumn-like mist upon the ground, and the air was chill, but soon the sun rose red in the east and the mist vanished, and while the shadows were still long and were off again, they rode now for two more days. All in the while they saw nothing save grass and flowers and birds and trees, and occasionally small herd of red deer browsing or sitting at noon in the shade. Sometimes Bilbo saw the horns of the hearts sticking out of the long grass, and at first he thought they were dread, dead tree branches. That third evening, they were so eager to press on, for Bjorn had said that they should reach the east gate early on the fourth day, that they rode still forward after dusk, and into the night beneath the moon. At the light faded, Bilbo thought he was still away to the right, or to the left, the shadowy form of the great bear prowling along in the same direction. But he dared to mention it to Gandalf. The wizard only said, Hush, take no notice. The next day, they started before the dawn. Before their night had been short, as soon as it was light, they could see the force coming as it met to them, or waiting for them to be like a black and frowning wall before them. The land began to slope up and up, and it became to the hobbit that the silence began to draw in upon them. Birds began to sing less. There were no more deer, not even rabbits to be seen. By all afternoon, they had reached the eaves of Markwood and were resting among the beneath, were resting almost beneath the great overhang boughs of its outer trees. Their trunks were huge and gnarled, their branches twisted, their leaves were dark and long. Ivy grew on them and trailed along the ground. Well, here is Mirkwood, said Gandalf. The greatest of the forests of the North World. I hope you like the look of it. Now you must send back these excellent ponies we have borrowed. The dwarves were inclined to grumble at this, but the wizard told them they were fools. Bjorn is not as far off as you seem to think, and you had better keep your promises anyway. For he is a bad enemy, Mr. Baggins. Mr. Baggins, uh, <laughs> Mr. Baggins, eyes are sharper than yours. If you have not seen each night after dark a great bear growing around with us and sitting far off in the moon watching our camps, not only to guard you and guide you, but to keep an eye on the ponies too. Bjorn may be your friend, but he loves his animals as his children. You do not guess what kindness he has shown for you letting dwarves ride them so far and so fast, nor what would happen to you if you tried to take them into the forest. What about the horse then, said Thorin? You shouldn't, you didn't mention sending that back. I don't because I am not sending it. What about your promise then? I will not, I will look after that. I am not sending the horse back. I am riding it. Then they knew Gandalf was going to leave them at the very edge of Mirkwood, and they were in despair, but nothing they could say would change his mind. Now we have all this out before, when we landed in the Karak, he said. It is no use arguing. I have, as I told you, some pressing business away south, 
and I am already late through bothering with you people. We may meet again before all this is over, and then again, of course, we may not. That depends on your luck and your courage and sense. I am sending Mr. Baggins with you. I told you that he has more about him than you guess. And you will find out that before long. So cheer up, Bilbo, and don't look so glum. Cheer up, Thorin and company. This is your expedition, after all. Think of the treasure at the end, and forget the forest and the dragon at any rate until tomorrow morning. When tomorrow morning came, he st he said. When tomorrow morning came, he still said the same. So now there was nothing left to do but to fill their water skins from a clear spring they found close to the forest gate and unpack their ponies. They distributed their packages as fairly as they could, though Bilbo thought his lot was wearisly heavy and did not like it at all the idea of trudging for miles and miles with all that on his back. Don't you worry, said Thorin. It will get lighter all too soon. Before long, I expect we all wish our packs heavier when we... When the food begins to run short. Then at last they said goodbye to their ponies and turned their heads for home. Off they trotted gaily, seeming very glad to put their tails through towards the shadow of Mirkwood. As they went away, Bilbo could have sworn he saw that thing like a bear left the shadow of the trees and shaded off quickly before after them. Now Gandalf too said his farewell. Bilbo sat on the ground, feeling unhappy and wishing he had been beside the wizard on his tall horse. He had just gone inside the forest after breakfast, a very small one, and it seemed as dark in there as the morning as night and very secret. A sort of watching and wanting feeling, he said to himself. Goodbye, said Gandalf to Thorn, and goodbye to you all. Goodbye. Straight through the forest is your way now. Don't stray off the track. If you do, it is a thousand to one. You will never find it again, and I never get out of Mirkwood, and then I don't suppose I or any else will ever see you again. Do we really have to go through? groaned the hobbit. Yes, you do, said the wizard. If you want to get to the other side, you must either th go through or give up your quest. And I am not going to allow you to back out now, Mr. Baggins. I am ashamed of you for thinking it. You have got to look after all these dwarves for me, he laughed. No, no, said Bilbo. I didn't mean that. I meant, is there another way around? There is, if you care to go 200 miles or so out of your way, north and twice that south. But you shouldn't get to a safer place even then. There are no safe paths in this part of the world. Remember, you are over the edge of the wild now. And in all sorts of fun, whether you go. Before you could get around Mirkwood in the north, you must be right among the slopes of the Grey Mountains. And they are simply stiff with goblins, hobgoblins, and orcs of the worst description. Before you could get around in the south, you would get into the land of the Necromancer, and even you, Bilbo, wouldn't need me to tell you tales of that black sorcerer. I don't advise you to go anywhere near those places overlooked by his dark tower. Stick to the forest, track, keep your spirits up, hope for the best, and with tremendous slice of luck, you may come out one day and see the long marshes laying below you, and beyond them, high in the east, the lowly mountain where dear old Smog lives, though I hope he is not expecting you. Very comforting you sure are to be, growled Thorin. Goodbye. If you won't come with us, had you better get off before any more talk. Goodbye, then, and really, goodbye said Gandalf. He turned his horse and rode into the west, but he could not resist the temptation to have at least one last word. Before he passed quite out of hearing, he turned and put his hand to his mouth and called to them, 
they heard his voice come faintly. Goodbye! Be good! Take care of yourselves! And don't leave the path! Then he galloped away as soon as light, as soon lost the sight. Oh, goodbye and go away, grunted the dwarves, all the more angry because they were really filled with dismay at losing him. Now more, now began the most dangerous part of the journey. They had each shouldered the heavy pack and the water skin which they were sh to share and turned from the light that lay on the lands outside and plunged into the forest. Whew, that is going to do it. That's, pa that's chapter 7. Tomorrow night, maybe, uh, we will do chapter 8, Flies and Spiders. This is an interesting chapter. Not one of my favorites, but it's still very interesting. Um, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for the likes. I love them. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. I did, the red hair has gone to my brain. I'm, as you can hear, I, I wasn't reading as clearly as I normally do. But either way, thank you guys so, so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll do it again. We will. And there's not really a ending for the, the hobbits. Uh, may the, the hair on your toes never fall off. <laughs>